I agree. <laughs> it is all very simple, though, isn't it, really? I had an Italian patient that used to come to me. She came for years. I never really did anything to her. She'd come in and say to me, Adatori, how am I feeling? I said, you're feeling fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> She came for years just to tell me, tell, for me to tell her that she was feeling fine. Now, if most people would accept that, they'd really be on their way. This wellness revolution of which Ron was speaking, it is taking place, but it isn't just in the healing arts, but there is something coming to focus in the healing arts because there are various ones in the healing arts who are beginning to see the way things really work that it is a case of inside out, not outside in. And they're finding each other. Dale mentioned the recent tour I was on. Well, I found men and women in the healing arts in England and Ireland and India, many other spots in the world I've been finding them. They're just delighted to be finding others who are thinking the same way. So it isn't something that's isolated but it's something that's taking place. Mention was made of the fact that I spoke to the homeopaths in India last year, a thousand of them. By the way, there's 300,000 homeopaths in, uh, in India, and there's 100 homeopathic colleges there. And they're concerned with what they call the vital force. Right? By the way, most people don't know what homeopathy is. I'll tell you what it is. If you go to an allopath, which we usually have in this part of the world, and you have a diarrhea, he constipates you. <laughs> if you go to a homeopath and you have a diarrhea, he gives you a physic. He creates more diarrhea. Okay? Homo means same, and that's what he does. If you have a hyperacidity, you go to the allopath, he gives you an alkaline mixture. Whereas when you go to the homeopath, he gives you more alcohol. He gives you more uh, acid. So he just increases the thing. And uh, they get results. <laughs> they get results. I think it's amazing the way results come. This, this thing that uh, Ron talked about, about the doctor doing everything backwards, but he was doing something right, wasn't he? He was doing something right. Primarily, what he was doing is there was an increase of life expression in himself. He was all enthused about this technique, about these stereoscopic x-rays. And consequently, there was more life flowing through himself. And because there was more going through himself, he was able to offer a prime to those who came to him for his service. And that's what any effective doctor would do initially. He would offer the prime. He'd be a prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> They give a prime, and it is that prime that assists the person to get something flowing. But before we get into that, I'd like to mention something that, that is taking place. There are all kinds of factors taking place out here that's beginning to influence not just the person, but the whole body of mankind is being influenced. And one of the things in the healing arts is money. Since the Phoenicians, it's been money. Can you imagine an insurance company now, they put out films on wellness, eh? because they're getting hit in the pocket. I just took out of the San Francisco Chronicle a little article. It came from my home area, from Boston. It said $238,000 for 37 days in a Boston hospital. Stay out of Boston. <laughs> Here's what it said, Boston. Boston City Hospital officials defended a $238,000 bill sent to a cancer patient for a 37-day stay. They said yesterday their billing procedure are no different than any other hospital in Massachusetts. Hospital spokesman, spokesman Paul Carey said the bill sent to Michael Saltwick, whose 55-year-old wife underwent stomach surgery this summer, reflected the cost of the service. It's a rip-off, said Saltwick whose wife also suffered from a heart attack and pneumonia, 
but recovered in his back home for $238,000. They ought to build a new wing for the hospital and name it in her honor. <laughs> Last year, General Motors spent more money on sickness with their employees than they paid money to the United States Steel Corporation, where they buy their steel from, to buy their, make their automobiles. That's pressure. <laughs> That's doing various things. And consequently, they're beginning to look at things. This is why they'll look at some of the craziest things today in relationship to healing because they're concerned in the tremendous outflow of money that's taking place. Now it does break down to what Ron mentioned here. The person's capacities have been turned to the environment out here right? and as long as your capacities are turned in this direction you're moving away from life. You're moving away from life. The thing is, is to have the person turn it around so that they begin to put their values here. And this comes primarily in their emotional and their mental realm. And they begin to have, I suppose we could call it internal values. They begin to be the thing that's, that's more important, these internal values. People just keep moving away from life. That's all it is. Sickness is just movement away from life. And if you keep moving away from it, well, you're going to be dead. On this tour I was on in India, I gave them the key to eternal life. The key, I gave it to them. You know what it is? Keep breathing. <laughs> That's true. But it is this movement away from life. Recently in Los Angeles, just earlier this week, I was riding along the freeway there. They go bumper to bumper at 70 miles an hour down there. <laughs> and I, I spotted this car in front of me and I looked at it and looked again and there was a, a person there with two heads. <laughs> and we finally got closer and I found out it was a fellow driving the car and it was his girlfriend. <laughs> she was sitting just about on him, his lap, and it looked like he had two heads as they went along. And it reminded me of something in relationship to this. <laughs> this, this reality, this internal environment, life, it isn't going anywhere. It is, has been, will be. Here it is. It stays there. It's this here which moves away from it. It moves away from it. And it is rather like the, the gent who was driving, driving along with his wife. And he was sitting here driving and she was over here in the other seat. And she said, darling, when we used to go together, you'd sit there and I'd sit right up close to you. And now here we've been married for seven years and you're here and I'm over there. And he said, well, I haven't moved. <laughs> Life doesn't move. It is. It's those capacities that have been moving in the wrong direction. And it is, really serving and, and, and assisting another is to have them turn it around. Right? And you know, some people just don't want to turn it around. Right? There are those who just love to be sick. Right? Uh, I've been working closely with a physician from Yale University, a surgeon, an oncologist, Dr. Bernard Siegel. And he has started a grouping in North America called ECAP which is exceptional cancer patients. And ECAP, exceptional cancer patients, are those who are concerned about getting well. Because he found out that 80% of his patients don't want to get well. They just don't want to get well. There's no big deal to getting well. Right? None at all. 
and he's now working exclusively with those who seek to get well. And he seeks to avoid as much of the technique as he can. His patients come to him now and he has classes. <laughs> he has classes, going over them, some of the laws of life, looking at their attitudes and what else. And he's really creating something. Now here's a, here again is a, is a man who is, is, is doing something. He's doing something. And we find all of these beginning to find each other, beginning with is a, transcendent, a transcending of techniques or, or everything else, see? MD, more debts. See? <laughs> DC, so I have that in the back of my name. They say, what's that, DC? I say, that's direct current. <laughs> <laughs> so we're getting beyond all of that. Human beings have been polarized here and being polarized here, they do have a mirror state of consciousness. They're just reflecting all of the things that are going on in their environment. A person whose capacities are turned in the right direction begins to have a window state of consciousness. And true education is assisting a person out of the mirror state of consciousness into the window state of consciousness. That's education. And by the way, if they do that, the byproduct of it is health, if they really let it take place. Because health is just a byproduct of this window state of consciousness. That's all it is. It's just a byproduct of it. And if one is, say, from this outer standpoint, they may be in tough straits. They, they may have all kinds of things going on in their physical body and what else. But if they make that turn, I mean, this power here, which created these capacities, created them to use them so that it, it could express itself, the moment it begins to express itself, boop, resurrection, <laughs> healing takes place. Came across a book recently, had contact with this gent also. He's a physician, Dr. Anthony J. Stadolaro. He's written a book, Recalled by Life. Dr. Stadelaro was the head of the Methodist Hospital in Philadelphia, a big hospital in Philadelphia. And a couple of years back, he found himself physically chuck full of cancer. And he went through the usual route. He was a doctor. He was trained in that. And uh, he had chemotherapy and, every, chemotherapy and what else. And then they said to him, that's it. You just have so much time now. And he had accepted it. After all, he was a doctor. <laughs> he knew. <laughs> he knew that was it. And uh, this very, this one day, he was driving on the New Jersey Turnpike, and he did something he never usually did. He picked up two hitchhikers, two hippies. And the two hippies got into the car. One got in the back and fell asleep. And the other fellow got in the front and started talking to the doctor. And this doctor opened himself to this hippie. And he started to talk to the hippie. And he, he opened his heart and he said, yeah, I've been given just a couple of months to live. I'm going to die. And he told the hippie he had cancer and what else. And the hippie said, you don't have to die of that. <laughs> he said, I don't. <laughs> no, he said, you don't have to die of that. So the hippie told him about a particular diet. Hey, microbiotic or whatever it is. But anyway, he, he followed the hippie's instruction. <laughs> Dr. Hippie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, today he's totally clear of cancer. They just did the full check on him. Nothing there. Hey? But you know, it just wasn't that miraculous diet that did it. First of all, as you read the book, this doctor had a whole new change of values. This, this condition, that was the bang to let him begin to turn around. Begin to turn around and face the direction he should have been facing anyway. Let me just read a little bit what he says at the back of the book here. Well water. <laughs> I know 
what, sick? I can taste the medicine in it. <laughs> he said this, so many months had passed since June 1978. So much had happened to me. And yet I had to wonder how much I had changed. Just an hour before, I was grabbing for my life, seeking the attention of God for more gifts. My cancer was the result of my taking and taking and taking until I had to ask for my very life. Selfishness is its own terminal illness. Now I wanted to live, and the only way to do that was to start giving. I could give for the rest of my life and not match all that had been given to me, especially the gift of these past two years. That was the greatest gift of all, to be handed back my life and to be given this knowledge after I had squandered so much of my past. This was the lesson I learned about true giving, that God bestows gifts even upon the unworthy. Such is the essence of love. He started to give. He started to get in harmony with this internal environment that's already doing that. He just started to get with it. <laughs> and consequently, the power began to move through. He took the handcuffs off the expression of life, and the moment he took the handcuffs off the expression of life, presto changeo. This is why, for instance, they find that in the cancer personality, there is a deep-seated resentment. There's a deep-seated resentment. There'd be no clearing unless there's forgiveness. The person is for something. They're forgiving. And when that is expressed, then things begin to clear. What's the big deal, as Ron said? No big deal. Right? If that internal power can take two germs in a 280 lunar days, put a baby together, I don't think there's any great problem if we let it go to work. But we need to be concerned with that. That's where our values need to be. The, the, these capacities here, they've been, they've been blocking the flow of that. I was thinking of a word the other night, a word in which most people are familiar with, miserable. <laughs> and do you know when the word miserable is miser? Miser? Usually when we think of a miser, it's someone getting worldly goods. They're the best kind of relatives to have, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, these capacities have been misers, absolute misers. If your capacities are a miser, you'll be miserable. Right? A miser in relationship to letting life flow through them, letting life flow through. And when a person begins to see what's what, and they recognize that they're not those capacities, they're not that, you have that, but they begin to realize that they are this right here. They are this right here. And the minute you see that, there isn't anything out here that can stop you from expressing the qualities of that internal environment. And by the way, speaking from an outer standpoint here, I like joy. Does anyone here not like it? I like, I like peace. Uh, I like all those things that are nice. <laughs> now here's my capacities here. My capacities say, I like those, do you? Okay, you're gonna get them. <laughs> and you express that through them. <laughs> <laughs> and things begin to work out just fine. Now many times in serving others, there are those occasions where people are, are closed down. There are, we suppose we might say there are limiting factors that are deep in the subconscious mind that are blocking that flow of life. And many times things need to be done. Possibly shock treatment. I'm not thinking of electric convulsive therapy. <laughs> By the way, did you notice they just voted it out in California? Huh? Part of it. Hey? That's brutal. But anyway, sometimes something is needed to break that block that's there. Hey? That 
subconscious block to life expression. Life is seeking to, to move it out. This is why many times when there are blocks there, you can go to sleep and you wake up in the morning and after a good night's sleep, you feel fine because the block has been cleared and life begins to flow through. But many times you, in working with another, you sometimes have to get in there and one has to do something about it. Uh, I was, was reading the story of uh, Alfred Krupp. You know Krupp, the munitions maker in Germany? Uh, he had a habit that when things weren't going right in his inter external environment, he'd go to bed for a couple of months. <laughs> hey? And this was at the time, this was at the time of uh, Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor. And Bismarck, he had a war on his hands and he needed this guy on a job. And here he was in bed. <laughs> so Bismarck thought he would send his doctor down to assist Mr. Krupp, who was lying in bed. So the doctor went down and he used the treatment that he had used on Bismarck. Okay? Very effective. And this was the treatment. He went down and crept. I guess he was a little thin guy. He was lying in bed there with his woeful countenance, they said. And this doctor, he had a long German name. He went and he stood over Mr. Krupp. He looked at him for a while. And then he used the treatment. He said, get up! <laughs> Bang! <laughs> now one might say that was quite brutal. It did the trick though. It broke the block. Hey, before he was closed down completely. Hey, and it began to move and it moved that little 98 pound form. <laughs> right out of that bed. You know how the, uh, just to begin to recognize what it is I'm talking about, just to begin to, to, to have a love affair with life, hey? to let one's heart and one's mind be all concerned. Here's a situation. Here's, a, here's an opportunity to let some life flow into this situation. And you don't have to be extra intelligent to know the qualities of life. I mentioned one. I mentioned joy. We're coming into a season. They sing that, don't they? Joy to the world. Good idea. <laughs> Who's going to give it? Who's going to give it? Is it, uh, is it too much joy on earth? No one wants to give any more. Does, is it needed? No, of course. Huh? Joy to the world. Well, let's do it. Huh? Because this environment here will just reflect what's going on here. When we begin to let it have its way, and we don't have to start anything there, it's already going. We just need to get with it, that's all. Get into alignment with it, begin to agree with it. We need to be what I call attitudinarians. <laughs> An attitudinarian is one who studies and practices attitudes. So that we are concerned that our attitude is absolutely harmonious to the nature and quality of that internal environment. What did the psalmist say? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh, internal environment. <laughs> <laughs> Let it be harmonious to that. This is what we're here for. This is why these capacities are here. They weren't put on earth to die. They were put on earth to be the means by which there could be a gusher. <laughs> by which life could have free, unfettered flow. And when that's happening, those capacities will be fine. The byproduct will be there. I've noted people who are all involved in their bodies. Yeah. I notice in taking case histories, people with constipation always knew when they had their last bowel movement. They always knew. They're watching them all the time. Eight fifteen. <laughs> Ball watchers. <laughs> when life is flowing through, it'll even take care of your bowels. <laughs> but because the capacities have been closed down, we've been busy reacting to the environment, it takes one away from life. 
It takes one away from life. There's a, a wellness illness continuum that this Dr. John Travis, who works with us, has. And he has one side, the illness side, where people are going down the drain. And the other side, the wellness side, where there begins to be a process of education and growth and expansion and consciousness. A very true diagram. But there is that neutral point where the person isn't ill and they're not well. And right at that, you know, no discernible symptoms as such. And I'd say this is the case with most people. You know, this kind of at that neutral point. NP, no power. <laughs> uh, just kind of there. Up in New Hampshire, we have uh, general stores up there. We have one in the little town I live in, in Epping, New Hampshire. It's called Fecto's. And these general stores have everything. We have a sign in the one in Epping that says, if we haven't got it, you don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a fellow who worked in that store. His name was Dudley. Dudley, been there for years. He was an NP, no power. Well, that's a political party up here, isn't it? But anyway, he kind of... <laughs> It kind of droop around. And one day, one of my friends walked into the store, and uh, he didn't see Dudley. And he said to the manager of the store, where's Dudley? The manager said, well, Dudley doesn't work here anymore. Oh, he said. Oh. He said, who's going to fill his vacancy? <laughs> he said, Dudley didn't leave any vacancy. <laughs> Isn't that the way with most human beings? Here they are on earth, they got those capacities closed down, little lights squeezing through every now and then, and they have a consciousness, well, a big show is on the other side, and I'm just working my way through. When I die, they'll jerk me to heaven, and I'll be fine. No vacancy. Well, we were created, these capacities, they were created not to fall apart on earth, not to get back into the dust again either, but they were created to be the means by which life, by which God might act on earth. This is our reason for being here. You might say a sick person gives evidence of the fact that God isn't acting through them. When we begin to see what's what, <coughs> Begin to let those capacities open up in the right direction rather than in X polarity, but begin to be in in polarity. Begin to let life have its way because the conscious mind, which as Ron emphasized, has the right to choose, it chooses, deliberately chooses to be identified with life and its qualities. And as life and its qualities are finding expression through these capacities continuously and And these capacities begin to even know you. They begin to know the truth. They begin to know the glory of living right here on earth. Now, in order for this to be something that moves with many, there have to be those on earth who come out of solitary confinement. A life has been confined by those capacities. Those capacities have acted as a jailer to stop life from finding expression. And it can, it can stop life from finding expression for just a, just a while. Eh? And then pretty soon the jailer is eliminated. Eh? Because life will have its way. And when we begin to <coughs> harmonize with life, because we love, people say, I love to live. Well, if you love to live, express the qualities of life. Let us live. And if we're really doing it, then our living will begin to be an inspiration. An inspiration for others. So that they too can begin to live. We were created on earth to live. And in order to live, there must be life. And if there is to be life on earth, you and I must express it. So the wellness revolution, the wellness revolution, did you ever hear of anyone seriously well? <laughs> a 
fellow on Ireland told me, no, he never did. He said, but I know some who, dis who are disgustingly healthy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just delighted to share this with you here this evening. What a wonderful privilege we have. That medical doctor that I read the article about who was squandering his life, throwing it away, forfeiting this gift of life. Well, let's not be stupid. Let's begin to appreciate this gift. And those who truly appreciate the gift of life, first of all, give thanks for it. Right? And not only do they just give thanks for it, but they begin to live it. Let's do it. Thank you.